When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> This episode of Twisted Tea Time is brought to you in part by... You! That's right. You listeners out there are pretty much why I do this whole storytelling thing. Otherwise, I'd be talking to myself, which is what I do most of the time since my roommate is the mortal body I'm possessing. Ha ha ha! But that's beside the point. If you want to support the show and help us grow, then you can spread the word. Like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Cheshire Hat. Follow us as we chase that tasty looking bird on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. But most of all, you can go to iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you get your podcast fix from, and give us a good review. Five stars, a like, ten happy faces, or whatever other metric they use. If you happen to have more money than you know what to do with, perhaps you could go to our Patreon page at www.patreon.com patreon.com forward slash the mad catter and consider signing up for one of our monthly rewards packages now i'm sure you're tired of me trying to sell myself so without further ado on with the show good evening kitties it is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers, the Mad Catter. And tonight, I'm on a walk. Yes, I decided to leave my little valley and take a stroll through the city. In fact, I'm on my way to get some tea right now. I'm going to try my hand at this concoction called Firefly, which is apparently vodka and sweet tea. So that sounds like it should be very tasty. I'll, I'll tell you how it is next week. Anyhow, I have a little time to kill, so perhaps I should tell you a story. Hey, hey man, got any money? No, in fact, I'm quite busy. Wait, wait right there. Give me your fucking money or I'll fucking stick- ah! I said I am quite busy. B- Jack in the Box Jesus, man! I could draw the Centaurus constellation with these track marks. Get your ass to a methadone clinic before, before I devour your soul. What? What the fuck are you, man? Holy shit! Don't hurt me! Don't hurt me! <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on him. I don't devour souls. Ah. <laughs> uh. Poor bastard. The self-flagellation that his addiction can sometimes take all the fun out of punishing or scaring some people. Hmm. This whole encounter reminds me of a story. It's a bit of a long one, but I think you'll like it. It follows a man named David, as he not only struggles with his addiction, but gets himself wrapped up in something far bigger than his all-consuming love of China White. I give you Anhedonius by D.A. Wilcox. One. One. The sign from above doesn't come in time to stop the man's finger from squeezing the trigger, and I don't think it's intended to, but it does come in time. In that last moment, that last tenth of a second, when the bullet tears a gap through the front of my skull and just starts to impact brain matter, that's when this all replays in a flash before my eyes, clear as crystal in perfect hindsight. 
The slowdown doesn't keep him from ending my life, but it does give me time to float in limbo for a while, with the last 1% going live time. I can already feel myself, my soul, my spirit, my essence, whatever the fuck it is, leaving my soon-to-be lifeless body here in Mercer's godforsaken laboratory and rewinding back into my pre-lab rat self and my first memory of puking on my mom's church blouse as a ten-month-old. It's all a fast-forwarded speed of light slipstream from first memory to childhood to manhood to my fall from grace and my ascension to the manifestation of grace itself. It slows down and then it grinds on the purgatory breaks. That fateful morning when I woke up and my wretched problems became a certain pharmaceutical giant's glorious windfall, and I'm reliving it again as some final gift and curse. A two-in-one combo, fate's endgame caveat to me for redeeming myself is the chance to relive the moments that mattered, the moments that gave meaning to my life and grant me some peace and reassurance. One last breath away from the end. The replay is the first thing that makes me feel since the floodgates were opened right after the inundation. The shock and awe of the moment shatters the anhedonia, and I find it ironic that the ultimate pain of a killing blow is the only thing that makes me feel again. But it's fine. It's all fine. So this is my choice. The bullet is resolving this fucked up mess for me, lifting the burden that I've carried, unaware from my entire life, liberating absolving. It breaks through all the tortured second guesses and musings on whether I did right by a moral code that never existed until they found me and spilled innocent blood. The round is one third of the way through my mutated brain when time stops completely and the bullet stops traveling. Maybe it's God's way of watching the sizzle reel of his latest casualty on the last spiral rung of the mortal coil and slingshotting me onto that home stretch of hairpin turns before I shuffle off it for good. The omnipotent, all-seeing, all-knowing creator, him, cranking the projector and me in the front row of the theater and filling in the shoes of the lead actor at the same time. He plays cosmic origami and folds space-time in on itself, but not for me, for you and your children and your children's children. Action. This is how it goes. Two. Two. The ruthless gorilla on my back rips me out of my shivering limbo at 6.42 a.m. with a primal biological roar. It's five or six days ago, but exactly how long? I couldn't tell you. The first shockwave reverberates up and down my body, and before I even open my eyes, I can smell my desperate miasma of sweaty filth that is steadily absorbed into my comforter and mattress overnight. Everything is soaked through, but I am shivering, and this is the breaking point, when natural sleep is no longer physically possible without a heavy blend of muscle relaxants and benzodiazepines to insist and usher it through. Peaks and valleys in my body temperature, deeply set bone aches, and the twitchy, restless kicking of my feet mark my descent into a domain of sleepless suffering. I know this world all too well. It is a shadowed reality in which I am a tormented spirit, drifting about, envious of those who awake to a new day to face the sunrise, with goals and to-do lists and optimistic aspirations of progressive revelry. I am an excellent faker, a trained chameleon, one who can keep my shoulders squared and reciprocate the imploring gaze of normals on the street as they pass by, fooled by a false smile that is all teeth and perfectly chipper. But the teeth in the back, the teeth you don't see, are rotted and abscessed in pieces. You see, the normal on the street would be horrified by the truth, that under the veil within me, everything is falling to ruin. 
My body has already leapt off the precipice of retaining any food for longer than 15 minutes before it comes back up. I am 10 hours away from being unable to drive. I am 14 hours away from being unable to walk or speak coherently. I am 22 hours away from full-blown hell. I have never reached the full end of the countdown or checked into a hospital. But I can tell you what happens next because one thing is guaranteed. This will not be the last time I wake up this way. Withdrawal envelops every waking second and divides time outward into a distorted and thin razor's edge that threatens the boundaries of my senses. It cuts into every breath, every pore, every moment of being. Each cycle festers the wound further. There is no healing to be had. I carry scars forever. It fractures that natural warmth imbued by the very beginnings of life inside the womb and destroys the balance forever skewing any concept of a comfort zone. Once deceived, I am forever betrayed by my own pleasure center to expect a singular and fleeting state of ecstasy that cannot be replicated by anything other than the devouring, priority perforating poison that systematically imbued itself within me. Heroin has dismantled my body and brain's definition of survival. The routinely simple act of standing to face the day becomes a daunting and seemingly impossible task amidst this crippled stupor. The horde of angered ice insects crawling just beneath my flesh will continue to intensify until it skitters like a raging swarm with no inkling of mercy. My gut rumbles topsy-turvy from its opiate-induced roller coaster. It flip-flops between the urge to purge itself through vomit and shit. Or both, sometimes simultaneously. This is only the beginning. I roll out of bed and grab my trusty five-gallon paint bucket in a clumsy race to the bathroom. I've eaten nothing in two days and have barely had anything to drink except water. The spastic mouthfuls of puke are nothing but pure, acidic stomach bile. I'm afraid to see the tar-like black blob that's exiting my large intestine from the other end. A sort of unique purged creature that I've given birth to hundreds of times, each increasingly more discomforting and revolting than the last. I dump my bucket and flush the results of my latest binge into the depths of this decrepit city and all its horrible temptations. Eyes tightly shut in denial, too afraid to see blood in the water, too afraid to see my face in the mirror, too afraid to see the hunger. This is the last time. Right. I splash cold water on my face after nearly an hour of suffering and refuse to look up and face what I become in the half-shattered mirror. The first hints of the sun creep through torn and ragged Venetian blinds as I fight a thirty-second war within myself that seems to last for an eternity. Never again. I microwave two-day-old leftovers from the coffee pot and manage to force down some of it before the mug slips from my hands and bursts into glass shards on the kitchen floor. I scream loud enough to wake others through the walls of my building, furious and full of hate for no one but the devilishly selfish little fiend inside me that grows and evolves by the second. He breaks through and takes control of me. And I am helpless and hijacked. I am in the driver's seat no longer. The fiend commands me to grab my phone, form the first two words with my other half. No, my other six percent. Quietly cursing what's left of my human side for even considering the thought of kicking off this nightmarish cycle all over again. I need... No, you don't. Stay away, fiend. Go away forever. 
I press delete and throw the phone across the room against the wall, with the fiend secretly hoping that it won't be busted when I inevitably lose another temporary battle at the mercy of his relentless assault. The struggle between what's left of my old self and the fiend gets more vicious as a fresh chill sweeps down my back and my nose starts to run. Logic parry, passion repost, and then he connects with a temptation slash to the jugular. The false flu drip, wobbly knees, and a newfound sense of enfeeblement reinforce the fiend's argument on all three levels. He scores the first point of many. My body takes his side. My mind takes his side. My spirit surrenders de facto, having evaporated long ago, along with my fiancé, all my friends, all my family. I trudge back to the living room and pick up the phone yet again. I open the sliding glass doors to the small patio outside and consider throwing the damn thing off the balcony into the stream of traffic below to be crushed under tires of a taxi or garbage truck. A fragment of humanity left within me smiles at the strength of considering such a proposition. But the fiend injects a potentially horrific thought of losing all the numbers for my backup contacts and less than frequent sources of heroin alternatives into the stream of protest. I have at least ten phone numbers for my main three dope hooks committed to memory, but I can't recall the number for my mother or my sister to save my life. The fiend tries to force my thoughts away from them and how long it's been since I've heard their voices. A fresh tsunami of guilt and shame pulls me within its undertow, providing the fiend yet another reason to grab the phone and cop a fix. A temporary 12-hour memory wipe fails to suppress the cold truth that I am a lost son and uncle to my sister's newborn twins. They are likely walking and talking now, but cannot recognize a sunken face that their eyes have never beheld and probably never will until they are sealed shut in a funeral parlor. I sputter after a throaty belch, and dregs of the microwaved coffee threaten to come up. I swallow them back down and shudder. The fiend interrupts my pity party while the logical me tries to divert my inevitable journey back to hell with any other way of surviving the next 72 hours without pissing away my life and future through a needle in my arm. Kill half a bottle of the bourbon in the freezer instead. Take some of those three-year-old expired rainy day Xanax from the trusty old kicking stash and go comatose for 16 hours before the real pain begins. The fiend says no. Kill the entire bottle, all the Xanax, all the Soma, and pass out forever. You can't win if you're dead. No. Make it even easier. Eat the business end of the Glock under the bed. Pull the trigger and leave a nice mess for your prick landlord. Tempting, but no. Rustle up some fake tears. Make a story about your grandpa dying and beg the fellow junkies across the hallway to share seconds on their morning black tar shot. Their fiend is more conniving and evil than mine. Not a chance in hell. Walk, Walk five, five blocks, blocks in the cold to the methadone clinic and get there before seven and just, and just maintain, maintain, motherfucker, motherfucker maintain, 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 maintain. Physically, physically you'll be well, well not high, high, but well, well enough, enough to keep to some, some food down. down. Food? food? <laughs> no. Pull, Pull out another cash in advance. Max out the fourth credit card and make it all better. Why, yes, Mr. Fien, that sounds like an excellent idea. Let's do that. My hands shake even worse now. 
with a renewed mixture of sickness blended with an anxious anticipation and an absolute fear that my first choice within the hierarchy of connects has a possibility of falling through. Amir ignores you if he's out, regardless of how many calls or texts he receives. Or he responds within five minutes and instructs you to meet him at one of many stash houses that he holds throughout the city. In addition to consistently providing powerful and nearly pure enough shit capable of knocking out an elephant with less than a tenth of a gram in the bloodstream, he provides deals to his regulars and is willing to front out advances to the truly dedicated junkies who will place priority on quality and ease of acquisition above all else. He also supplies me with clean points and a safe and private place to inject. I key in a badly garbled text message, riddled with extra characters and absent of any punctuation whatsoever. Good morning, Good morning friend. friend. Can, Can I, I please, please stop, stop by to see Helena? Helena. I, I miss, miss her no, no front, front to does. does. I have, have money is. Fifteen hundred apostrophe hours. Okay, thanks, brother. Oops. That's the fiend spelling it out just a little too quickly. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm here, my man. I need to stop by and see Helen of Troy. I miss her so dearly. No credit needed. Nine o'clock sharp. Thank you, brother. The next four and a half minutes stretch out into a continuum of eternity as I stare at the digital clock on my microwave, pacing back and forth from the kitchen and into the living room. My finger hovers over the send button to my plan B connect. <laughs> Good old pow pow. And my phone beeps with the heavenly godsend of a newly arrived confirmation from Amir. All oh, good. She's ready for you, and she's brought a friend. Got a little extra surprise for you today. The fiend inside assumes full control. A rush of prefix adrenaline manufactures itself out of nowhere and floods through my legs. I slice my foot on a broken shard of glass from the coffee cup in my haste to find the most presentable pair of pants from the wrinkled pile in the corner of my living room that hasn't been laundered in over a month. I don't feel or notice it until I shove my socks and shoes on. My observatory window gets a little fuzzy. Hypophysis, anterior lobe, optic chiasma, ophthalmic nerve, olfactory trigone, all is shredded now. The first half of my brain is mush. This bullet is making impressive progress ripping right along. I am a third person observer of my own body on autopilot as it bounds down the stairs three at a time opting for a quicker descent to the street than the elevator. The fiend traverses the grid, cleans out what's left of my account at the ATM and nearly sprints the remaining nine blocks to Amir's building, stopping to vomit one last time into a storm drain, oblivious to the judgmental, baffled looks of sour disdain on the faces of the pedestrians unfortunate enough to cross Captain Sidewalk Fiend's path. In the back of my mind... I can't help but feel as though I am being watched by someone other than a random stranger on the street as the fiend pulls my puppet strings. Fate holds more than a ritualistic and routine shift from misery to paradise for me on this gloomy overcast morning. Enter the morning of my life that starts like any other. The change that needs to happen, that is bound to happen for someone like me, is not the change that actually occurs. It should be the first step towards sobriety, death by the hand of the fiend in the form of an overdose, or suicide. But it is none of these things. It's a change that will transform the world when it is finished with me. And if I might redeem the small shred of a soul that remains in my wretched body, then this is the day that fate guides me off my own desperate and pathetic path of self-destruction towards an encounter with an evil more potent and terrible than anything 
I could have possibly comprehended when I woke up this morning, sick and sad and pathetic as always. <laughs> it's true what they say. Once a junkie, always a junkie. But what they don't say? Even junkies can have a purpose. And mine is not to save myself. It's to save everyone else. Three. I rap on the door to Amir's apartment with both hands. Three over two. Spiral out. Spiral out. Of his many quirks and paranoid requirements to complete a transaction, a codified rhythmic pattern pulled straight from Tools Lateralis signifies that I am not his cleaning service, a rival from Midtown with a gun, or a Jehovah's Witness. My phone buzzes with another text. Quirk number two. Password? I check the calendar app on my phone to see if it's an even or an odd week of the month, and to confirm what day it is. Horsh homunculus, I say out loud in the empty hallway, feeling like a fool, but jumping through the required hoops nonetheless. He opens the door, and he is the first human being of the day that doesn't give me a once-over of pity and disapproval. He grins, and I manage a forced smile, not to match his candor, but because I'm a few more painful minutes away from being well. And that's the only thing that matters. Ah, Davy boy. It's been a bit since I saw you last. Amir says, chuckling as I slump onto his sofa. You've been avoiding me, eh? Going for that cheap fent cut garbage from the gulch, no doubt. Going for nothing, actually. I was two days into the good fight, but... <clears throat> Fuck it. I confess, failing to meet his gaze and dropping my cash roll on the coffee table, opting instead to stare at the paintings on the wall. I have to play downtown tonight, and there's no way I can hold a beat like this. They'd boo Chance off the stage before we even got through the first song. Two oil paintings of Willie Nelson... One in his young years and one in his sixties seemed to be watching me, eyes piercing through my putrid soul. The Peeping Willies, as Amir's customer base has dubbed them, have seen me transform countless times in this very room, from a hollowed weakling to a fiending phoenix, rising from the ashes to spread my wings and soar over cloud nine. Who knows what else they've beheld from their stationary post of observance. I certainly don't want to know. Amir cleans his hands with Purell, knowing full well that my own are too shaky to properly prepare a shot to hit myself with. He obliges me the courtesy of mixing part of my purchase into a new dope cooker with bacteriostatic water and a micron filter. He knows that I need .4 grams of the three and a half I've just bought before I'll offer much in the form of conversation. He draws it up into a fresh lure lock rig, breaking the seal to fill it with 40 units of golden amber liquid, barely translucent and devoid of any air bubbles. The nectar of the gods, my be-all and end-all, ready to plunge me into paradise. Hey, Amir, go ahead and make it a straight G. Point four ain't gonna do it tonight, I say. Sure. No problem, D. Just don't be nodding out halfway through your set, brother. Amir says with a chuckle. He ties the tourniquet around my forearm leisurely and pulls a sealed vial with some sort of intricate logo on it that appears to be an interlocking W and M overlaid into each other. The liquid inside glows in the light of the living room with an electric sapphire color. I find myself captivated by it. Normally fixated on the pulsing of my go-to vein of choice on the left side of my hand leading up my wrist, Hell's Highway, 
but the vial demands my attention as Amir stabs the syringe into it, drawing up a remaining forty units. What? What are you doing? What the fuck is that shit? I ask, intrigued and annoyed. Curiosity piked, but struck by a sudden onslaught of unrest that my fix is delayed by the substance in question. I could save his life and tell him to pour the crude blue down the sink, but then the butterfly wing flap from earlier when 0.4 became 1.0 could become a tsunami that levels Japan, and more than 12 perish in the lab a few hours from now as they try to harvest it again. There's already too much blood on my hands. This is that little extra I was telling you about on the phone, Amir says, smiling from ear to ear. You don't even know how fortunate you are to be getting a taste of this. Nocturnus Illuminatus. My sister's boss hates it, but all his lab geeks are calling it liquid blue. Whoa, 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 Amir. Your sister? This is a new product from Mercer Pharma and it's not even out of testing yet? I thought you were going to mix in a little coke or ketamine or something. You know I'm picky. It, is it an opiate potentiator? How many people have fired it as a speedball? Do you have some Narcan? What if I fall out? You know I'm not big on contaminating my first... I trail off as two massive men in expensive suits come out of the bedroom in the hallway with a briefcase. I forget to keep speaking and let out a startled cry of surprise. They unlatch it on the table and slide it across to a mirror. It's more cash than I have ever seen in my life. Neatly folded in perfect stacks of crisp hundred dollar bills. At least half a million, if not more than that. It's remarkable, really, how your entire world, the people you know, the routines you come to expect, they can turn over on themselves in a matter of seconds and explode into chaos. Holy oh, shit. shit. What, what is, is this? this? Amir, what the fuck, man? Who are these... You were right, the first suit says. He did say exactly what you said he would. I told you, boys. He's my favorite junkie. The only regular I'll hit and take care of like this. And he's a damn beast when it comes to tolerance. <laughs> he could fire this entire bun and still not fall out. <laughs> Amir cackles, pulling one of the bill rolls from the briefcase and placing it under his nose as he sniffs it. Hey, wait a second. What are they paying you for, Amir? I grab my drugs instinctively and rip the tie off from my arm as I rise to my feet, backing to the door slowly. Look, I don't deal. You're looking at possession and purchasing, but he'll never testify against me in court. A fucking narc, Amir? You're all so careful, man. How did they get to you? At least let me shoot my ship before you arrest me. I can't believe this bullshit. The second suit pulls a silenced USP-45 from his jacket pocket and places it firmly against my temple. Sit back down, sir. You came here to get high, and you're going to get high, he says, chillingly calm and collected. Yeah, not cops. I'm not going to jail, but something inside me tells me that would be the better scenario. My heart pounds and races. For the first time in my life, there's a fully loaded shot of heroin in front of me and I don't want it. I take a deep breath and try not to make any sudden moves. Both suits are watching me like birds of prey. Cap it off. The last ten units. The first suit says to Amir. Look, fellas. Amir says, trying to reason with them. Put the gun down. He's the last guy you would ever have to force... The suit redirects the gun from my head and fires a round into the ceiling with a muffled whip before placing it back against my ear. It burns my skin and I wince in pain, but I don't say a word. Okay, okay, chill the fuck out, Jesus Christ, Amir interjects, filling the last ten units of the lure lock with yet another vial of clear, normal-looking fluid that the suit with the briefcase pulls from his pocket. It's not labeled, 
and could be anything in addition to the liquid blue that's turned my shot completely cerulean, seemingly undiluted. Any latecomer to the party would have no idea it was a combination of three substances, and the encased fluid loses none of its strong blue hue. You're going to be fine, bro. My sister works for Mercer. They're just paying me so they can keep you doped up for free and observe you for the first twelve hours while... The second suit fires another round into the ceiling. Not another fucking word, Pavel. The other suited man roars. You inject him in the next thirty seconds, or the cash goes out the door, and the rest of this clip goes in your chest and brain. Got it? I'll tell your sister the junkie swiped my piece and shot you. Don't test me. Oh, man. Oh, God. I should have just gone to the clinic. I can't believe this has happened. Not no. another word from you, either. Or there won't be enough heroin in the world to stop the pain from the next bullet shattering your kneecap, Davy boy. They know my name. Amir ties off my arm again, pierces my flesh and misses my vein completely. I wince with the flash of thin metal digging inside the scar tissue, and he has to back out of it and re-register. I shiver. Because in two years of trusting his expertise, I realized that I've never seen him miss. Ever. It's okay, Amir. Just do it. I say, shaking all over and terrified, but trying not to show it. The most pathetic part is the fiend inside me is still excited about being fed and even more so about the rush of a new high that he's never experienced before. Memories and lapses of a feeling catalog dance through my mind, searching for a way to compare what I'm about to feel to the warm and itchy onset of pins and needles from heroin, the instant numbed jumpstart dopamine flood from cocaine, the breathtaking euphoric creeping embrace of oxymorphone. You're going to be fine, man. You're gonna feel great. When this is over and they have their data, I'm gonna give you a hundred thousand bucks of my cut. He trails off as the red plume of blood floods into the barrel of the syringe, indicating that he's in. And he pushes the plunger home. I close my eyes, sweating bullets as I release the tourniquet for a second time. I wait for the rush. The familiar warmth blends with the foreign elation and then it feels like weighted anvils are pulling down on my chest. I surrender to it, but I know I'm about to fall out. Not from an overdose, but something entirely different. It's almost like a K-hole, but ten times heavier. I've done enough barbiturates to realize part of the mix is a tranquilizer, without a doubt. I feel consciousness starting to slip, but I want it to go because it feels so wonderful. Go. Pull the van around. I don't have to come with you guys, right? Nope. You've done your job. Don't spend it in one place. I've got maybe ten seconds left before my senses shift away into induced sleep. But I try with all my strength to fight it. To listen. I open my mouth to speak, and the sound is the weak moan of a groggy specter. A doped-up visage who can barely strike two barely coherent words together. What... what was that last stuff you put into... uh... My voice slurs as I start to drift away. I hear the last words foggy and distant and a hundred miles away before the blackness takes me completely. I hear the muted whipping of another gunshot and feel the vibration of something hitting the floor near my feet. It could be a body. The last words. They're not Amir's words. The voice belongs to one of the suited men. Thorazine. Nighty night, you poor bastard. Welcome back, kitties. 
I do hope you enjoyed that tale. Things aren't looking very good for old Davy Boy now, are they? What will happen next, I wonder? Well, you'll have to stay tuned to find out. Now. Given the topic at hand, I figure it's only fitting that I bring something up here. I'm sure you all know that heroin is indeed a fiendish substance, and there are a lot of people struggling with it today. If you want help, it is out there. If you need help for a loved one, it is out there. And at the risk of sounding sappy, I'd like to point you in at least one direction that might be of service. Well, might be of service in the United States. Elsewhere, I don't know. I'll, I'll probably add some things in the comments section of my social media or SoundCloud pages if I can. Anyhow. There is a website called heroinaddictionstories.com. There, you can read the stories of those who have struggled with heroin addiction, as well as use their hotline for any help you might need for yourself or your loved ones. You can reach the heroin addiction hotline at 888-339-339. 30 that is 8883397630 well with that sobering bit of information out of the way let's move on to something a little more cheerful shall we i have a new segment on this show since i do so love storytelling and those tale tellers who tell stories i'm going to add a segment that will be known as the podcast shout out hell i might expand it to discuss books movies and shows but for now it'll focus on the medium i'm rather intimate with so without further ado Do you like horror stories, creepy pastas, or maybe you like hearing about true encounters with creepy creepers and cryptids? Perhaps you like learning about supernatural creatures like vampires, werewolves, and skinwalkers. Well, have I got a podcast for you? Go check out Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales. The host is a positively delightful man from down under and is always bursting with joy to tell you of the things that will leap from the shadows to tear you apart. He updates every weekday and his episodes are bite-sized morsels of lore and storytelling. You can find them on SoundCloud, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast goodness. Just look up Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales. In further news, he and I are working on a collaboration for my next episode, which, yes, means you kind folks won't be getting another dose of Anhedonius until after that one airs. My apologies. In turn, he will feature a story or two of my own, original stories at that, on his podcast. So do check out Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales, and if you can, tell him that the Mad Catter sent you. Well, kitties, I believe that is all for tonight. So be careful out there in the big city or the wide wilderness. And sleep sweet, if you can. Alas, my friends, the time has come. I know, I know, our tale's not quite done. Come back next week to hear me rhyme. Until then, rest your head, for it's your bedtime. <laughs> Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams.
The Mad Catter Presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or they are public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com as well as Jason White at www.soundcloud.com forward slash angels dash of dash despair. Music used for Anhedonius Part 3 was obtained from www.freemusicarchive.org and is by Pipe Choir. Find more of their excellent work at www.pipechoir.com. If you want to support the show, go to www.patreon.com forward slash the Mad Catter and sign up for one of our low-cost $1, $2, or $5 monthly subscriptions and get a couple of little bonus perks while you're at it. For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com forward slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. You can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Cheshire Hat. So, until next time, kitties, good night and pleasant dreams.